from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. I'm really honored to introduce to you one of the world's great illustrators of children's books. Jerry Pinckney has found his calling early on and was designated the class artist back when he was in elementary school. In his career, he has worked on more than 100 children's books and won countless awards. He's adapted lots of fables and folk tales, including The Tortoise and the Hare, The Little Red Hen, and The Lion and the Mouse, for which he won the Caldecott Medal. But he has also illustrated many other types of books, and all of them feature beautifully expressive artwork, playfulness, warmth of feeling, and intriguing details. His latest is In Plain Sight, which was written by Richard Jackson and captures the sweet relationship between a man and his granddaughter. Mr. Pigney will be signing books from 2.30 to 3.30, but in the meantime, please help me welcome him to the stage. Well, thank you, Abby, and I want to thank um, certainly everyone here um, for attending. I mean, isn't this amazing? It's amazing, and this is, this is probably my, my fourth uh, time here at the National Book Festival, and I can't tell you each time that I enter in this space surrounded by folks like yourselves, these bright smiles, uh, and this energy that you don't get any other place. So thank you for being here. Um, today I'm going to be presenting my new book, a collaboration with Richard Jackson. He wrote the text. And before I do that, though, I want to talk about the how and the why of uh, how did I happen to actually work with, with Dick Jackson on this project, and what was the pull to me to illustrate this book. Well, each book that I illustrate, there has to be this opening up that allows me to actually inject in the project something personal. And if we go all the way back to my first book that was published in 1964, which was The Adventures of Spider, a West African uh, folk tale, Nancy the Spider, you could see the draw was being a, of a person of color. So all along, what, what has to be there, uh, and I'm very blessed and fortunate to have many, many projects offered or that might come my way, how do I enter into it? Now, if we talk about books that I've um, reimagined from my childhood, the connection certainly is my childhood. But in fact, if, it's, if the birthing of the text comes from someone else, how do I enter? So here we go. We'll go into In Plain Sight again by, uh, by Dick Jackson. Uh, the way it works in publishing is that a publisher will acquire a text, a story, by an author. Uh, then the search is to find that right artist that's appropriate for that particular story. Then the next step is contacting that illustrator to see if, in fact, he's interested. Because the value in illustrating someone else's text is that you see value in it, that you see it's an, it's an important project for you to do. So in this case, I get the text. And it's a sort of um, hide-and-seek kind of a game that a grandfather plays with his granddaughter, Sophie. So. He, I'm looking for that sort of opening. What, what is pulling me to illustrate this story? Well, I have a nine-year-old, at the time, a seven-year-old great-granddaughter. And what I thought was kind of interesting is that, um, and I couldn't figure this out, that even at seven, if I would, if they, and they visit with us often on the weekends, so if I were to come home a little later than they arrived, and she knew I was coming in the door, in that room, she'd hide. And I couldn't figure out, you know, um, at seven, she's going to be eight soon, and she's still playing hide and seek. And so what touched me in this particular book 
which is a seek and find, was that young Sophie actually hides from her grandfather. So I'm going to introduce you to a little bit about the other things that lead into uh, why a project might be important. So this is supposed to advance. OK, all right. So this is my studio. Now, a little bit of um, a little bit more history. Um, the grandfather will hide objects. So I was thinking about this as well. You know, how do I present this? And I thought, why don't I do, why don't I introduce you into another world and another connection? My studio. And I love to collect. So there you see um, my studio, my drawing table. Um, uh, by the way, this, you, you see that? That's a pheasant, which is a mount that I've been actually doing drawings of. But I'm fascinated with objects. So you can see that's another pool. Uh, Sophie's grandfather actually hides objects. And I love objects. As a matter of fact, I'm a little over the top. This is just a, um, it's a table. And it's a table, the purpose of this table is really to hold some of the things that I'm most interested in. Uh, I would love to walk in the woods. I love feathers, shells, anything that gives me a sense of, um, uh, I think it's, it's just a feel of the tactile feel of things. And if I'm interested in, in nature, what better way to introduce nature into my life, into my studio, but through the collection itself. So now, here's what I didn't discover. Remember I said this story is about uh, a sort of a seek and find? And so when I present, and I just presented this to school children the other day, and, and I, this, it came to me, if we look, very closely at the image, there is a, got to help me, there's a dinosaur, I'll give you a clue, that's orange, and then there's a small rabbit. Now, this was not done on purpose. It has nothing to do with this book other than the fact that you can see that's a kind of a bridge into this story that makes, because I will oftentimes, sometimes I use these little small animals as uh, like research, as models. And what I love to do is just plop them down anywhere, somewhere in the studio. So here we go. The models. And um, I knew in this, way, in this case, um, I, the models would have to, in some way, uh, know each other and relate in order to talk about this very important, important relationship. So we have here Sophie, and that's her real grandfather. OK, so now I've set this up so that you can help me as well. That's the room. Now, Sophie's grandfather is wheelchair bound, and his universe really is the universe of his room. So we'll talk about, it at, maybe at the end, how important it is for me to talk about, even though his world is a small world, he's confined to a wheelchair, so he doesn't leave that room. He still has powerful interests. And also, I want you to watch out for, can you tell something about Sophie's grandfather through looking at the pictures? So that's his room. I'll give you a little clue. You know that there's a banjo case? Can we assume that he's a musician? Maybe. All right, that's the, that's the title page that you guys know. Uh, that introduces you really to the relationship between these, this powerful um, grandfather and, and the powerful love that a grandfather has for his granddaughter. Okay. Now, ready? Sophie lives with mama and daddy and grandpa who lives by the window. He can see Sophie come and go, call and wave, goodbye, hello, as he looks out. Here's where I need you guys' help. And after school each day, Sophie looks in. Here I am, Grandpa, she says. How was the morning? 
Surprisingly, he says, I had me a paper clip, you know, nice and shiny. Now it's vanished. Help me find it, will you, with your bright eyes? Where, says Sophie, that's just it, honey. You have to look. Ah. If you lean close, you might hear Sophie say, oh, and eventually you find, you might hear her say, there. Good, says Grandpa. Thanks, honey. Here I am, says Sophie on Tuesday. Ah, Sophie, he says. How was school? Good. It was a blue day. Well, well, I can see that. And how about you, Grandpa? Today was regretful. Oh, yes. Had me a rubber band. Stretchy. Boing. Now, boing. That band has gone. Help me find it. Huh? And eventually, in plain sight, Sophie finds the rubber band. Here I am, Grandpa, says Sophie, on Wednesday. Was today better? Not so much, Grandpa says. Had me a drinking straw, bendy, just right. You remember, now it's skedaddled. Now, what I want you to do, and I know it's very difficult for you to do it here, but see, search the image and see if you find the drinking straw. But I'll give you a clue. That's on the window frame. So the idea of the book is, of course, you'll go back and forth with that. I'll look, says Sophie. I wonder. And eventually, in plain sight, good girl, Grandpa says. Thanks. Now, you notice something else that's happening here is, of course, is the days of the week. On Thursday, Sophie says, here I am, Grandpa. Anything missing? The other thing you'll notice, you have this feeling that maybe Sophie is in on this game. You think so? On Thursday, Sophie says, here I am, Grandpa. Anything missing? Well, wouldn't you know Grandpa's favorite, Grandma's favorite painting brush for watercolors, child? I'm missing that. Can you help me? Lovely. I can try, says Sophie. And eventually, in plain sight. So I don't know how well you guys are doing on this. I imagine the kids with their sharp eyes may be a little keener, right? Here I am, Grandpa. What day is it now? Here I am, Grandpa, Friday at last. You bet, honey, he says, turning his smile to her. But wait, just look. Oh, Grandpa, you silly. Keep the dollar, Sophie's. Tomorrow, he says, you can buy yourself something with it. So did you guys ever try to put a, uh, a dollar in your sort of eye socket between your, your eyebrow? I tried it. It's all, you've tried it? it yeah, have, were you successful? Yeah, my, I had a hard time with that. Anyway, so here I am, Grandpa, Sophie says, early today. No shopping? Well, best to save that dollar, I guess, for college. Now, let's see. OK. Had me a what? A lemon drop. Delicious to think of, but then it just trotted off, unlicked. Don't tell me, Grandpa. And in Eventually, in plain sight, 
Good girl, says Grandpa. No, no, you have it, Sophie. Sunday morning, as usual, at his door, Sophie starts to say, Grandpa, here I. But Mama hushes her. He's sleeping, which gives Sophie an idea. She whispers it to Mama. Daddy laughs when he hears, all right, he says, if you tiptoe. Here's Sophie at her quietest, her tiptoeing S, the curtains at Grandpa's window. Well, keep your eye on it. And eventually, where's Sophie? Grandpa wakes, oh, yawns, ah. Behind the curtain, a commotion. Wiggly, a jiggly, and giggly. Sophie's grandpa says, that's you. Why, I'll be. Here I am, grandpa, Sophie says. Here I am. like always. Now, here's the thing. Um, the book is really very much like, again, that what do, what do I look for? Well, I have a great granddaughter. And she's with us mostly on the weekends. We have her two cats. And by the way, you'll see how the role of the cat in all of this. But Sophie. My granddaughter, Zion, who again loves to play hide and seek. And as a matter of fact, she brings me back to a kind of youthfulness that I've almost lost until my, my great granddaughter. Um, one of the things I wanted to do with the art uh, was to talk about that relationship. But I also wanted to talk a lot about uh, the grandfather. And I wanted to talk about his sort of backstories. So when deciding where to hide the objects, I chose ob places where it would sort of demonstrate and speak to um, this world that, uh, and a well-lived life of the grandfather. So the, the, the um, uh, paper clip is in the band of a, um, a soldier's cap. So it suggests, it just suggests that he was in the army at one point. Uh, and then, of course, the rubber band was, was wrapped around a football. Um, and there's, um, and these is the, the role of the artist is to actually build a world, to build a sort of a visual world for the readers. And you'll notice next to the football might be a, a trophy. Uh, football trophy. So I'm letting you in on something, or I'm actually letting you read the pictures. So not only is it a search and find, but it also deals with the life of this grandfather. So, and it goes on to the, of course, um, and then you have the, um, I'm trying to think of the order of the paintbrush, which was that we get a sense that um, the, grand, the grandmother uh, was a painter. And that's, of course, of value to him. So it goes on, of course, the lemon drop. Who could resist the lemon drop, right? Exactly. So that's in a, in a box of marbles. Now, how, do, how did I decide about marbles? Because when I was a kid, I loved playing marbles. And so that you can see not only in my illustrations, working towards uh, 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 speaking to the, in, um, the story itself, the text itself, but we're also giving uh, I'm giving you a part of my, my life. Now, I, if you guys venture into buying the book, I want you to look under the cover, because underneath the cover, you can't see it now. So that means you really have to buy the book. But the case cover, is, it's not only the, the objects that you find in the book that the grandpa hides, 
but also in the case cover are the tools that I use to make the book. So you find my, and so you'll find in this illustration pencils that I use, pastels, of course, watercolors, and, and pencils. Um, now pencils is, is a, a, the, really the instrument or the drawing tool of choice. Um, and a little story about that, because I had a, an interview earlier, and we were talking about the love of drawing. And I said, um, you know what's so cool about all this? I'm just thinking about this. I said, you know, if you read about me, and I write a lot of story uh, pieces, essays on my process, and the medium is pencil and watercolor on paper. Okay, so I write a lot about the fact that, that again, that tool, uh, an instrument of choice to help me make marks is the pencil. Now, here's the thing that I just thought about. When I was a kid growing up, I didn't have access to art materials. Uh, my parents weren't uh, museum or gallery visitors at all. Uh, they didn't have a cool understanding of what, it, what an artist was. What's interesting is, although they supported their young son's need to draw, so I always had materials at hand. Here's the cool part. I grew up in a very small street in the Germantown section of Philadelphia. All of the neighbors were African Americans who migrated south. Outside of that world were our Jewish and Italian communities. So in the 40s, we were somewhat isolated. In order to keep the young boys somewhat busy in a positive way, we were encouraged to draw. And I just said that the, my parents didn't have a sense about what art might lead to, but the boys were actually encouraged to draw as a positive way to use that time. I'm going to go back to the fact that the, pen, the um, pencil as instrument of choice. On that block of row homes, and the end of the block, there was a factory. The factory was a pencil factory. And my grandfather worked in the, the factory. And, um, and he would bring home lots of pencils. So here's the thing about being an artist. For you parents out there and grandparents that might have children that are interested in, 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 in drawing, that key piece that started when I was a very young child. The passion and the love for making a mark and then making a mark with a pencil. And that has stayed with me over the course of some almost 55, my first book was published in 1964. It was done in pencil with color washes. And today when I get up in the morning, and most days when I get up in the morning and I walk to the studio, uh, I sit down at my drawing board, and most often I pick up a pencil. Thank you, Grandfather Charles. Thank you, guys. Well appreciated. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. I, I think that's it. Time's up, right? I have two minutes. Do I have two minutes if there's a question in the audience? Yes. Do I ever get frustrated when my drawing doesn't turn out the way I want it to be? Well, I, as a young artist, you did, because you're always searching for an idea to, to actually to build on. Um, I will tell you this, though. The frustration as an adult artist tends to lead to a better result. Why? Because frustration means that what you see from, that comes to mind first is not working. Most oftentimes, in order to do more of a, an original idea, you have to dig a little deeper. And the gateway to sometimes digging deeper is frustration, that something isn't working, and then how do I make it work? That's a very good question. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, how are we doing time-wise? Oh, yes. We got time for another question. You might have to help me. I can't. I can. When did I start drawing? How old are you? 
Uh, six? Yeah, I started when I was probably, you know what, to tell you the truth, I think I started as soon as my parents gave me something to mark with and mark on. And by the way, mark on, at one point, I told you, I'll just help you tell you about a little bit about my father's encouragement. I was on a bunk bed. I had the top bunk. And guess what? I would sometimes draw on the wall. But however, this is it. My father never scolded me. You know what he did? Every once in a while, he would paint over the drawing, and I would start again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your smiles and your support. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.